everyone. Uh, thank you for making the time to come to the dermatology um, presentation this morning. Um, we see the crowd is not that big, so thank you to all of you who came. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our next chat of the community. He will be discussing uh, the cutaneous manifestations of secondary circulate. We still tend to see quite a bit in dermatology and the presentation of secondary circulate is always interesting. It's always very, and we still tend to see quite a bit. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, morning everyone. Um, just as Dr. Musa has already um, introduced, um, I'm Dumi Silebe, and I'll be speaking on um, syphilis this morning. Um, syphilis, as we all know, is the greatest imitator um, as as the, as the cutaneous manifestations of syphilis can can mimic almost any cutaneous disease, and because even though the treatment has been around for for many years, and it still remains a, ma a major health health problem, so we at Simja we still see about five to six ma male patients a month with with syphilis. So I just thought um, maybe to um, shorten a very broad topic into an hour, my, my talk will basically be focusing on secondary syphilis rather than the whole um, topic of syphilis. So uh, my talk is basically gonna encompass three clinical cases that were seen at clinic. They all had secondary syphilis, just that they, they, um, they had different cutaneous manifestations. So um, the first case was a 21 year old male patient who was RVD negative. He presented with a five-week history of um, scalp hair loss. He also had a presented with a non-pruritic rash that involved his face, trunk, limbs, uh, palms, and soles. So on clinical presentation, he had these hypopigmented um, crusted macules on the face and scalp. He also had lichenoid and skin-colored papules and plaques on his trunk, upper and lower limbs, as well as his groin. And then on his palms, he had these coppery hyperpigmented plaques with a colorite of scale, um, which are known as syphilids. So um, he also had this moth-eaten um, non-scarring alopecia on his scalp, as well as inguinal and cervical lymphadenopathy. So these are just the pictures that we took on his first presentation showing the moth-eaten um, distribution of alopecia involving the frontal and occipital part of his scalp, as well as is the upper and lower um, trunk. Um, the next picture that just show, next picture just shows the lichenoid plaques on his trunk as well as upper limbs. Uh, the scaly plaques um, that are seen in syphilis. Um, uh, and then the next picture just shows the hyperpigmented coppery plaques on involving the palmar plantar uh, surfaces, um, with just with the scale that is called the colorate of, um, of scale. So this is known as the syphilids. So if you see um, lesions like this, then a high suspicion of secondary syphilis um, is high up on your list. So this is just a close up of the same lesions, the lichenoid um, plaques on his groin and lower limbs. So um, we came with came up with the following differentials. Top and off the list was secondary syphilis. Uh, a differential diagnosis of sarcoid was also made, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, a psoriasis, a PLC, a PLEVA, as well as scabies. So on investigation, um, on his serology, uh, what was noted is that his RPR was positive with a high T-cell of 64 and a positive TPHA. He was RVD negative. And then we went on to do a biopsy, uh, which was in keeping with um, secondary syphilis. So on his first presentation, um, the patient didn't have the blood results. So we basically uh, had to counsel him about the possibility of his rash being uh, secondary syphilis. So we recommended testing and treating for his partner and counseled him that he might have to repeat the RPR and the HIV test in future as we um, treat him. And then we um, counseled him on the um, possibility of an, an exaggerated reaction to the treatment that we are going to put him on. 
And then because we didn't have the serology on his first visit, we just put him on doxycycline, 100 milligrams BD for a week, and he was to be followed up in a week for the blood results. He was also put on emollients as well as hip scrub um, to wash the body. So after a week, we had the positive RPR and the TPHA. So we started him on benzathine penicillin um, IMI injections at a three for three weeks at a month at, at weekly intervals. And then we followed him up. We, we, we saw him every Friday because he was coming in for his injections in hospital. But after three weeks, we noted um, a difference in, in his skin lesions. And then after three months of uh, follow up, his um, RPR was then negative. So this is just uh, um, the pictures that I took after three weeks of, of the injections. Um, his um, lichenoid prox had basically flattened. He was just left with the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. His face has, had cleared. This is just a close-up of the um, um, non-scarring alopecia. He, had, he was getting some hair growth and just a um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation on his back there as well. And then on, on, on his palms, the um, syphilis had almost disappeared uh, after three weeks of, of treatment. Um, so then um, the second case was another male, a 31-year-old male patient who was RVD um, positive, but not yet on, yet on treatments. He was an inpatient who had, was, who had been admitted with the generalized body pain, fever and weight loss. Dermatology was called in because of a two-month history of a progressive painful nodular and ulcerative skin lesions. Um, he, he said that the lesions started off as pustules that then enlarged and evolved into ulcers involving his whole body. He recalled that he had had a papillus squamous eruption, a fever and a sore throat uh, four months prior to the current uh, presentation that he had, GP, that he had been treated uh, by a GP. So on skin examination, he had these um, large, severely crusted ulcerative lesions that were varying in depth and circumference. Most of his lesions had uh, were annular with central crusting involving his face, limbs, and trunk. He also had the same syphilis, the, cop the coppery colored plaques uh, with the colorate of scale on the dorsum of his palms and soles. Uh, on the dorsum of his feet, as well as the palms and soles. He had no genital lesions, and he also had um, shorty firm and non-tender lymphadenopathy of um, the inguinal and posterior cervical lymph nodes. Um, so um, this patient was seen in the ward, so his um, serology was already um, in the file, um, already. So this is just um, pictures of him, sorry. Um, so the... Uh, different um, sizes of um, the, his nodular ulcerative lesions vary of his hands. Uh, this close up of the same lesions, um, severely crusted uh, lesions. Um, this is uh, of the fillets on his. And then a close-up of the ulcerative um, lesions as well on his, just at different stages of healing uh, were also noted. Um, so this patient, um, close-up of um, the dorsum of his feet, showing the syphilis as well as the ulcerative lesions. Um, and then so um, a differential diagnosis of Lewis Maligna was made on this patient. Uh, the other differentials were atypical mycobacterium, uh, and a deep fungal infection. Um, but we already had um, the serology for him with a positive RPR and a, C and a TPHA that was reactive. He, was, he had a very low um, CD4 count, which led us to the suspicion of a Lewis maligna and a very high viral, viral load. The rest of his serology was basically um, negative with TB and fungal cultures that were done on biopsy were also negative. And the biopsy that we took uh, was also suggestive of secondary syphilis. So um, this patient was straight away started on the benzathine. Um, so this is just the histology um, of, 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 of his biopsy. Um, so this patient was also was, was uh, put on benzathine penicillin at, at three um, week, at, at weekly intervals for three weeks. 
he was given flamazine to apply to the ulcerative lesions as well as emollients, given a heavy scrub to wash um, the body. And then he was also counseled on, um, on the exaggerated response to uh, antibiotics that is called the Yerish Hexheimer reaction. Um, so this is basically a reaction that we see uh, in patients that are initiated on, 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 on the antibiotic treatments that most of the time they have a very low um, CD4 count and a high viral load. So when you, as soon as you initiate them on, on the antibiotic treatment, they have a dramatic response to the treatment. So these patients within six to eight hours, they start um, having, um, um, ch um, ch they start having chills, fever, a headache, they can be hypotensive, and then they can be exaggeration of the skin lesions as well. So we counsel patients before starting them on treatment that if they um, experience such symptoms, uh, we don't stop the treatment, but we, um, we add prednisone to the treatment. Um, so on follow up, up of um, this patient at, at, in a month, um, his ulcers had dramatically um, responded to the penicillin. His ulcers had formed scum that had completely healed, and he had also been initiated on ARVs. This is just uh, a journal on the Lewis on Lewis Maligna that I found on the British Medical Journal. Um, just uh, basically highlighting that this is. Um, um, a form of secondary syphilis that is um, described in people with HIV uh, infection. It also highlighted that the HIV infection may affect the presentation, the diagnosis, and, and the diagnosis of, se of secondary syphilis. It also highlighted that people living with HIV are 60 times more likely to present with this form of secondary syphilis. And then a lot of, um, of the reported cases were from patients that have very low CD4 counts and that um, the um, patients who are acutely infected with HIV are the at-risk population for Louise Maligna. The third case was a 57-year-old male patient who was also RVD, not on treatment yet. He had a very low CD4 count of 27, as well as a viral load of 99,120. He presented with a six-month history of an unpruritic rash involving his whole body as well. Uh, he um, recalled that um, he had the rash had been preceded by an, a, an ulcer on his penile shaft, which were, had been followed by a map, macular papillary rash, which had resolved spontaneously at home. Um, and then um, over the months, the rash came back and basically evolved to what he presented with at clinic. So on his skin examination, he presented with these hyperkeratotic papules and plaques with heaps of scales, uh, which are called rupioid plaques. Um, he, his lesions involved his trunk, upper and lower limbs, um, and also on his penile shaft. He also had um, um, palma, he had palma uh, keratoderma, as well as his nails also had, had hyperkeratotic and subangle debris. So this uh, next series of pictures just um, show the same lesions. Uh, that I've just described, the uh, so hyperkeratotic um, lesions. So it's basically um, superficial ulcers with um, heaps of scales that represent uh, an oyster shell. So he had these lesions on his trunk, upper and lower limbs, as well as his groin and involving his penile shaft as well. This is just a close up of the same rupioid plaques um, on his trunk and upper limb. Um, same lesions on his back and elbows, the same lesions on his abdomen. And he, um, yeah, just the extent of, of the rupiate plaques um, involving the dorsum of his hands, upper, basically the whole body. He had had these um, lesions um, evolving over six months. And then on his um, close-up of his hands, he, the lesions involved the web spaces, which made us also think of scabies. Um, he also had these rugged cuticles as well as sub-angle um, hyperkeratotic debris that you can appreciate on this picture. His, uh, the palms of his hands had a keratoderma, which is just a hardening of the skin. And then you can also just appreciate the um, syphilids on, on the palms as well as the rupioid plaques on the wrist, a close up of the same lesions. 
Um, so this, um, in, in the same lesions involving, you can see the healed ulcer that had preceded the rash on his penile shaft, um, as well as the same lesions, basically. Um, it also involved um, the dorsum of his feet. So the, the differentials for this patient uh, high up on the list was a rupioid syphilis, uh, a rupioid uh, psoriasis, a deep fungal infection, mucocutaneous candidiasis, as well as crusted scabies. So um, from the three um, patients that I've presented, um, um, at the diagnosis of secondary syphilis was made from all three patients, but it's just to highlight that um, secondary syphilis in itself um, has a, a, like a, a whole area of um, clinical or, or maybe cutaneous manifestations, the, the different manif um, cutaneous manifestations of the same disease. So this patient um, didn't have serology at clinic. So we, um, on his first visit, we did an RPR, which came back positive with a theta of 32. His TPHA was also reactive. He was HIV positive with a low CD4 count and high viral load. The TB and fungal cultures were negative and the biopsy was very suggestive of um, rupioid syphilis. Um, so he, on the first visit, this was just the histology of his um, biopsy. On the clinic visits, uh, first clinic visits, we recommended testing and treating and, and treatment for his partner. Uh, we counseled him on the future tests for um, RPR, as well as the yerish hexheimer reaction that I've explained. Um, he got a, dox, a dose of um, doxycycline, um, 100 milligrams BD for a week. He was to be seen at um, in a week's time for his serology. And he was also treated for scabies. Um, so we gave him BB lotion as well as emollients. He was given hippie scrub um, to wash the lesions. And then this patient was planned to be put on um, benzathine penicillin IMI injections, but he was unfortunately lost to follow up. So I'm uh, moving on to my discussion, which will basically just um, focus on secondary syphilis more, uh, more than the, um, the whole topic of syphilis. So basically syphilis is caused by an infection with trypanema pallidum, um, which is a spirochete, which, which affects human hosts. And the, um, the most common uh, mode of transmission is sexual contact with an infected partner. And it's seen a lot in, in men that have sex with other men. Um, so um, syphilis is basically stage, put into st uh, four stages based on timing and presentation. So from the time of inoculation, um, um, it can take up to 10, it can take 10 to 90 days um, for a patient to present with the symptoms of primary syphilis, but the average is three weeks. And then there'll, there'll also be a hematogenous um, dissemination of the spirochetes basically that can take up to um, three to 10 weeks after the presentation of primary syphilis for a patient to then present with the skin manifestations of secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis can um, take up to 12 weeks for the lesions to, to, to disappear. The lesions can disappear spontaneously or with treatment. And then most of these patients um, can either go into um, a latent phase, or they can um, can or can they or they can have a recurrence of of the rash. So, and then the next stage being the latent phase of syphilis, which is basically when the serology of um, syphilis remains positive, but you don't have a clinical presentation or you don't have any um, skin lesions. And then the last stage, uh, which would be tertiary syphilis, which which we see more than two years after the latent phase of syphilis that can take up to 20 years to present. So we hardly see tertiary syphilis. Um, so secondary syphilis, like I've already highlighted, takes about um, three to 10 weeks to present uh, after the, um, the presentation of uh, primary syphilis, if the patient even sees um, notices that they have um, the primary syphilis, they don't normally present at that, at that stage. So these patients basically have um, low-grade fever, they have arthralgia, they have a headache and weight loss and a sore throat. Um, they have um, lymphadenopathy, which can be generalized um, and painless. Um, lymphadenopathy can involve the cervical, postericular, as well as epitrochlear lymph nodes. And then they may also present with a moth-eaten 
um, scalp alopecia. Moth eaten alopecia that may um, um, involve the scalp, the eyebrows, or even the beard, um, like in the first case that I presented. So on the skin, um, the, the lesions of secondary syphilis span a spectrum. So in the early phase, they, will, they might present with a non pruritic discrete macules, which just involve the flanks and the shoulders. And then as the lesions progress, they can become more macular papular. They can become um, papular squamous. And then some, sometimes they can present with infiltrated lesions. They can present with annular lesions as well as corimbos, um satellite papules, which is corimbos lesions are basically um, satellite papules that surround a larger central lesions. Um, and then we, um, we just say they look like a cluster of fruits. They can also present with just patches or these copper colored plaques of um, syphilis that I've been highlighting in the three patients that, that we saw. So still on skin, they can preserve, present with the rupioid rash, um, like in the third case that I presented, which is basically just the superficial ulcers covered by piles and piles of crust um, resembling an oyster shell. They can also pre present with just a specific rash on, of, of syphilids on the palms and soles. They can also present uh, with what is called with a uh, coro which what is called corona veneris, which is just a rash um, that occurs on the seborrheic areas, which is basically the front part of the scalp. I'll show a picture of um, the corona veneris um, later on in my talk. They can also just present with hypopigmented macules on the neck. Um, in the distribution of a necklace, which is um, loosely called the necklace of Venus. So this is the corona veneris um, rash that um, is also just another form of syphilis that we see. Um, um, and then on the mucosa, um, you, we see, you can see a split papules, which are just papules that occur at the angles of the mouth. Um, they can have mucus pa um, patches in the oropharynx. They can also have condylomata, condylomata lata, which are just um, grayish um, mucosal patches uh, covered by membranes in the genital tract. They can also have what is called a snail tract ulcers in the mouth. And they can also present just with the tonsillitis without the other lesions in the mouth. So they don't always present with all the um, clinical um, pictures that I've, 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 I've discussed. So this is just a picture showing the split papules on the angles of, of a patient's mouth, um, just to see what it looks like. Um, and then there's just um, four more, um, I mean, so five more um, different presentations of secondary syphilis, which are rare. Um, so the, there's a nodular secondary syphilis, there's an annular secondary syphilis, which is the picture that is depicted on the, this is my right. Uh, and then there's a pustular secondary syphilis, which patients can also present with. Um, there's a fem fembroisiform secondary syphilis, as well as um, the nodular ulcerative secondary syphilis, which is called the Lewis maligna, that I presented with the second case. So these are just the atypical um, manifestations of secondary syphilis. So moving on to the investigations that we do um, for syphilis. So um, the investigations are basically divided into direct and indirect tests. The direct tests um, we don't normally um, do. What we do is the histology. So this is the biopsy that we do. It just falls under the direct test. The PCR is too expensive and uh, unavailable to us, as well as that dark field microscopy. We, we don't have it readily available. Um, and then, um, then the indirect test is what we um, we do on patients. Um, so they also the indirect tests are also just divided into um, triponemal as well as non triponemal um, tests. So the non triponemal tests basically um, test um, they 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 pick up the um, cardiolipin in that patient. So patients who have syphilis, um, they tend to aggregate. They aggregate a cardiolipin in the serum, and and this is the this test is to the um, that is aggregated in the patient's serum. Um, so it um, um detects it themselves directly. So that's why they are called non-triponemal. 
the treponemal test is basically is that it's a TPHA that we with, that we have readily available and that we do, and this is a direct test um, that basically picks up the antibodies, um, the treponemal antibodies. So um, just to expand on the direct test, the histology, um, we basically there's a special stain that is done on the um, on 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 the sample um, called the Wathen study that basically detects these spirochetes uh, of syphilis. So that's um, diagnostic of, of syphilis. And then um, the dark field microscopy um, is a test that you can do uh, bedside. When you take, um, you can take um, a fluid from, from a primary or a secondary syphilis lesion, put it onto a slide and um, basically view it under a microscope. And then the histology, um, and then the PCR can be done on the histology that we take but it's just an expensive test that we don't have. Um, and then, so the management of um, secondary syphilis basically um, involves the general measures as well as um, antibiotic therapy. And the general measures is what we do. We counsel with test partners and do contact tracing. Uh, and then um, have to make sure that you have the HIV test is done. Um, a CD4 count, we know what the CD4 count is so that we can and almost um, like um, counsel patients about the Jarex Hexheimer reaction that they'll get if the CD4 count is low, um, as well as the RPR and TPHA. So um, from all the tests that I presented, we just have the, uh, we just do the RPR and the TPHA. And then, um, and then the T, the RPR we we use it to monitor response to treatments as well. So, um, in order for a patient to um, for you to be happy that the patient is responding to the penicillin treatments, the teeters have to at least come down um, six times um, in 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 three months. So we repeat the RPR in, th in the first year. We repeat the three, uh, the RPR in three months as. Uh, and then in the second year, every six monthly, we repeat the RPR just to see if they're not getting a recurrence or if they are responding to, um, they've responded basically to the injections. The TPHA, um, which is the, um, the direct test, um, basically remains positive for life in patients, but there's a small percentage of pa patients that might uh, have a, a negative TPHA. Uh, after being treated, but it's only like 24%. The rest of the patients um, just remain with the TPHA for long. So it's quite hard to tell whether the syphilis is quite recent or if it's been there for, for, more, than um, for more than two years to guide treatments. So, and then, so the antibiotic therapy um, for primary, secondary, as well as the early latent phase of syphilis is that is a benzathine penicillin 2.4 million units as a stat dose. Uh, if the patients are allergic to penicillin, then they get doxycycline, uh, 100 milligrams BD for two weeks, uh, or you can give them tetracycline, uh, 500 milligrams QID also for two weeks. If the patients um, can't tolerate the um, doxycycline or the benzo uh, benzathine penicillin, then we they can get Kevtriaxone, IMI or IV for eight to 10 days. So oh, that brings me to the end of um, my talk on secondary syphilis. This is just my references. Thank you.